The Women in Public Office is a five-month intensive program comprising leadership development as well as political systems training for aspiring political leaders. The 2023 program will take place later in the year and let's find out more about this initiative and uh, we speak to uh, future elect founder Lindiwe Mazibugo who is with me in the studio. It's so good to see you. It's good to see you too. I haven't seen you face to face in a very long time <laughs> thanks to COVID. Yeah. But talk to us about um, future elect. For people who don't know this mm. initiative, this is not something new. You started it some time ago, but what is the purpose of it? Uh, yeah, so I co-founded Future Elect in 2018. Mm. Um, we are a non-partisan, non-profit political leadership development incubator. Yeah. What we do is we support particularly young people and women, but really anyone between the ages of 18 and 45 who has aspirations towards either, either running for office or becoming a political appointee in government. So yeah. as you know, ministers, mayors, premiers have special advisors who have subject area expertise that they don't necessarily have in, on their own as ministers. And so we invite people from specialist areas in the private sector, in, in academia, in community organizing to avail themselves for roles as special advisors so that they can be part of the political leadership process in government. Yeah. So we've been running the program in Southern Africa for five years. We have 100 graduates and um, we've got three very important elections coming up in 2024. Um, yeah. Another one this year in Zimbabwe, but also uh, Namibia, South Africa and uh, Mozambique in 2024. So one of the things we've been thinking about is how, you know, how can we be, be a, an organization that champions, supports, trains, but also creates opportunities for the best people in our society to actually be our public representatives. Yeah. And how can we place greater emphasis on doing that for women? Because we don't have enough women leadership, we, women leaders in politics, and certainly in South Africa. So we're starting with a program this year um, in South Africa. It's five months long. And we, we just want to support women on two fronts. If you're already in public office and you're seeking re-election, yeah. or if for the first time you've decided the time has come for me to stand, I, I want to run for elected office, I want to avail yourself, myself. And, and the idea is to A, create a, a community of practice, women across the political aisle having an opportunity to learn from each other from a common values basis, you know, yeah. you know equality, accountability, um, you know, uh, you know, ethical leadership, these things that run across political ideology. Um, and then give them a chance to get fit and ready for a campaign um, and to encourage political parties to consider bringing more women and more young women in particular um, onto their party lists ahead of the elections. In essence, you are training future political leaders. And you mentioned there a few seconds ago, mm -hmm. Zimbabwe. Yes. That country is going to go into an election this year, yes. although we don't have a firm date just yet. How difficult a job is it trying to train people coming from that country? What stories are you hearing from them? Yeah, it's actually turned out to be uh, far more straightforward than we ever anticipated it would be. We obviously understood that for many countries in the SADC region, but for Zimbabwe in particular, yeah. Um, you know, open society, um, free and fair election, the freedom to associate politically is caveated for many reasons, depending on who's in power. And so we've always understood that we need to make sure that we create the best possible environment in which the people who do our programs can be successful. Over the five years, we've always had representation from Zimbabwe, and we've usually had someone from both the ruling party and the opposition. And it's been extraordinary to see how Usually they don't have the opportunity to be in the same room when they're back at home. And this yeah. is true of South Africans as well um, and people from other countries. Um, and so what initially starts out as a kind of mutual suspicion becomes a, hey, this is our country. We have a lot in common in terms of what we're trying to achieve. But no, we don't have the same view about economic policy or land reform, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. And that's absolutely fine. So one of the reasons we created this program is to pierce those political bubbles where people all kind of talk the same, think the same, have the same ideas, but never welcome contesting ideas from the outside. And the idea isn't to change each other's mind at all. We're not trying to convert people. 
The idea is to expose them to different thought and to help them think through what it's like for them to govern with people who don't share their ideology. How do you sit in committee and legislate? How do you form coalition governments? How do you compromise? How do you treat each other like human beings and not name call such that your, your voters and your supporters start burning each other's homes, mm. for example? So that's the kind of political culture we think young people can be at the forefront of, but they need to experience it as part of a learning process and future elect attempts to provide that. Ethical leadership mm -hmm. is also at the core of what you are trying to instill. Yeah. How difficult a job is that? I'm, I'm now moving away from Zimbabwe. Yeah. I'm including South Africa as well. Absolutely. So I think a lot of people think of corruption and maladministration and mismanagement of public funds as a kind of goodies and baddies thing. Mm. What we've encountered through interactions with civil society, with whistleblowers, and also what we've watched in the state, cap in the state capture hearings, is actually that it's kind of more like there's a slide. You know, one person approaches you, it's almost like sexual harassment. Someone puts their hand on your leg one day and you don't say no. And then it goes a little bit further and you don't say no. And before you know it, you're so compromised, you can't get out of it. And now you're part of this web in which you've benefited quite a little, a very small amount of money, a million rand here, some suits there, an education at university for your daughter here. Things that comp compared to a 1.5 tri trillion rand budget yeah. are actually very small. But you've sold out that governance process slowly but surely over the course of a lot of manipulation. And so we try to convince everybody that they must remember that they're, but for the grace of God, go there. They're not special. None of us are special. And so you need a community of practice of people who are always saying, hey, that's the road to somewhere you don't want to end up. Or hang on, I saw what you did in that interview. I don't think that's what we stand for as people who believe in ethical leadership. Yeah. So it's very nuanced. I think we'd like to think of it as just goodies and baddies. You know, if I'm in government, you know, I'll just be a crusader, etc. But the stories we hear of people who are slowly but surely brought on to the state capture, the corruption, the self-enrichment kind of train. And the stories we've heard of people who feared for their lives if they didn't turn a blind eye to these things, who had yeah. to resign and so on and so forth. So it's partly reminding people that that danger is always there and you must have an, a moral compass of your own that prevents you from ending up there. You must surround yourselves with people who hold you accountable. Yeah. But also you need to surround yourself with people in politics, in government, who emulate those values that you want to aspire to so that you don't get put in a situation where a shady contract is put under your nose and you must choose between either signing it or putting your life in danger. And we, and we mustn't minimise the fact that a lot of public servants face existential life threats. We all know about the late Babita Diokaran, who, 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 who is not with us anymore because she had the courage to stand up and say to her CFO, this is, this is very, this is not normal. We're not, I'm not making these payments. But it's not that simple for everybody. So how do we create an environment that is secure? How do we elevate and support leaders who emulate ethical governance? But also, how do we make sure everybody understands that this is a contagion that can touch anybody yeah. and that you have a duty as a public servant and as a political leader to be vigilant at all times and in all circumstances? I'd like to conclude this conversation on that theme of ethical leadership. Mm. But I want to ask you a different question, mm. and it relates to your former party mm. having held an election recently. It's not so much about the leadership. Of course, you're welcome to express an opinion mm. there. But the Democratic Alliance mm. of late, there are issues that relate to ethical leadership mm. that are coming up more and more. Mm. Randall Williams at one point in Twane, he has since left. Uh, Malusi Boy in Cape Town, the MMC for housing there, he has been removed from that position, although there is no finding against him or there's no charge against mm. him just yet. Is this something that you think South Africans should and would have expected for a party that has always said where we govern we govern better and more importantly we are allergic to corruption so i think one of the things that really became crystal clear for me when i left politics is that for a political party to say we won't steal your money is not a manifesto promise it's just your job mm -hmm. it's like if a doctor says i won't kill you like that's not you're not supposed to 
So to come out and say, I'm better than the other parties because I won't steal, it's not enough. All the parties need to say that. Everyone needs to commit to that. So if we take ethical government or if ethical governance as a given, what advocate Tuli Matonzela, who's one of our guest lecturers on the program, likes to say is that one of the problems we have in this country is consequence management. You will act unethically if you are inclined to do so if you think there are no consequences. So if you think you're going to get away with it. So how do political parties, how do governments engage in consequence management? And I think I heard a part of your question to John Steenhuisen. You know, how long have you known about this? And to what extent is you know, exposing people's corruption a political tool to achieve a different outcome mm. than just you know, imposing ethical governance? And to what extent is this something that you as an organization have got rigorous systems in place to always check and recheck and check again. And I think often you find that inside political parties there's a temptation to both be an organization that has consequences, but to be selective about who is, you know, who is a who is a beneficiary or who ends up being you know, a victim of that consequence management. And yeah. I think that's dangerous because how a political party governs internally is a reflection of how it ex expects to govern externally. So if you have political parties who, just at the party level, level with low, you know, no financial stakes, no governance and so forth, if you have political parties, and this is not just the DA, and, and again, these are allegations, I don't know how true this is, but you know, we've seen it in the ANC, we've seen it in many political parties where people have dirt on each other and they kind of hang on to that dirt mm. because they think it might be useful later. And then when it comes out, you're like, hang on, you guys are very confident in this knowledge you have about this person. How long have you known this? Yeah. And why was it okay for this person to stay in office or in many cases stay in government and be an exec, you know, to, to have executive authority of, over public finances while you as a political party were aware that they were compromised? Mm. So I, I think it's, re it's, it's really behooves political parties to, to think really deeply about how they publicly engage in consequence management. And I think the most effective use of consequences is when you see that this doesn't benefit a party politically, it could actually impede their options at election time, but they have the integrity to actually step up and say, this is not acceptable. Yeah. This is not who we are as organizations. I have to ask you this question. Mm -hmm. Do you think the DA has gone beyond or has overcome, I think is the word I'm looking for. It's overcome the white party stigma that whenever there is a black leader, that's a person that's been parachuted in. Mm. And I use that word advisedly having had a conversation with Helen Zille mm. yesterday who mm. said, and I think it was part of the learning process, that it's important that you don't parachute people into positions of leadership, mm. um, essentially from nowhere. Mm. Do you think the, the, the DA has overcome that hurdle or it's actually gone worse? So I, I don't think it's as simple as overcoming a PR problem. I think every party's public image is a, is a reflection of what that party is internally. Hmm. It's also a reflection of how South Africans process issues around race. So I can recall from my time in politics, whenever a black person stood for office, they were inexperienced, they were not ready, it wasn't their time yet. Whenever a white candidate stood, they were experienced, they had been in the system for a long time. It was the base assumption. Yeah. The same thing happens when women candidates stand for election. The assumption is immediately that if you're a woman, you're not experienced, you're not ready. And one of the things that really matters in government and governance is what experience matters. Does sitting in a bench for 20 years count as experience? Or does having built organizations outside politics or achieved academically or otherwise outside politics and then gone into the space five years ago? Mm. Does anything that you did before politics count for something? And often the, 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 the mark is moved in order to, for people to be able to rationalize in their heads this idea that black people in a party like a DA must necessarily be newbies, followers, you know, Johnny come lately's parachuted in from the outside, therefore not necessarily deserving, um, as opposed to white leaders who are assumed to have been there since the day dot, et cetera, when the DA was only formed in 2004. So even the party is new, right? So, and I think it's, it's really sad to see that because what ends up happening is people's predictions, their internalized feelings about how race works in this country then get replicated, that, you know, that becomes the outcome. So... I really liked it when Mbalintuli on her resignation, I mean, I read her letter when she left the DA, detailed how long she's been in politics. 
I mean, that young woman has been in politics certainly longer than I have. Yeah. And has been doing politics since she was at university. But constantly faced accusations of not being ready, even when she ran for party leader, not being ready too soon, is she the right person? So if you have that culture in a political party, it's going to be even harder for black people as leaders in the party to break through. That's one thing. The other thing is I'm not, I'm not in the party anymore. I don't have many connections to the party, as, 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 I, as, as many connections to the party as I used to. Many of my friends are still there doing incredible work. Yeah. But I do think your, part, your party platform, how you speak about race, what policies you advance, are necessarily a reflection of how you internally as an organization organize around race. So if you say things like we're colorblind, everyone sees color in this country. Mm -hmm. The question is, what do you see when you see my color? Do you see that because I'm black, you think I'm incompetent? or you think I'm corrupt, or you think some others, you know, negative stereotype. If you see somebody white, do you think they must be the right person for the job? Or if they're a man, they're definitely in charge, you know? So when you say things like we're colorblind, what are you saying to people for whom race is something they wish wasn't the defining attribute of who they are? But it is because we live in a racist world, a racist society, etc. So it's complicated. I don't want to paint with broad brushstrokes. I think all political parties have many, many ideological kind of factions across the spectrum. And I think what ends up happening is one will win over the other at any yeah. given time. It seems to me that in the DA, there is an effort right now to, to pack race a little bit to the side and to talk about other issues, possibly naively believing that race can be like ignored, which I think is wrong. I wouldn't do that in a similar position. Sure. Um, but I don't think that necessarily means a racist organization. I think most of these organizations are reflections of our own societal issues around race. Very briefly, for people who are interested to be part of the future elect program, what dates can they look forward to uh, so that they can join? So the women's program applications are opening uh, today on the 3rd of April. They will be open until the 3rd of May. Um, as I said, this, this is a program for women and also gender non-conforming people. So if yeah. you're non-binary, this is a program for you. Um, whether you're in a party or not, whether you've been in office before or not, this is an opportunity to do everything in political leadership besides the ideology stuff. That is fundamentally a product of just people from different tr traditions engaging with one another. So we do personal leadership development. We do the status of women in politics and government. We do you know, gender, gender lens policy making, all of these things. Um, and we do it in an environment that enables young people to, in a sense, practice what yeah. a life in politics is like, which is compromising, engaging, coordinating with people who may not share their ideology. Lindy Omazaboga, it's been a pleasure to have you here. Please visit us more. I will. Founder of uh, the Future Elect program, a very, very important program. I think you have heard exactly what is on offer. If you're interested, well, uh, look forward to uh, that particular program. I'm sure uh, there is a website, Future Elect, that uh, you people can visit if they are indeed Future interested. Futureelect.org. Future there it is. Wonderful. All right.